Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by CoolStuffing.com, CardHoarder.com, Alter Sleeves, as well as Twitch subscribers and Patreon supporters just like yourself. I am Evan Irwin. We get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, and by that I mean my one co-host this week, Ruben Bressler. Hey, I'm actually here. Remember that time that I embarrassed myself by sleeping in and, <laughs> by which I mean passing out and then not waking up for the show? Uh, but I'm here this time. You're here. Um, yeah. Uh, we're currently... So it's the two of us. It's the two of us this week. Right. It's just the two of us. We can make it if we try. They wrote a whole song about it. It's fine. We'll be fine. We're here. I don't know if we will be fine without adult supervision, but we can try our best. Fortunately for us, we have a jam-packed news week Woo! with lots of topics You guys to would not discuss. imagine so much magic news this week that we're filling already in minute one. All right, that if you missed the pre-show, subscribers to this channel and or our patrons get access to our NSFW version early, and we kick it off with our first pick in our giveaway. Get your chance at 50 bucks worth of anything at CoolStuffing.com by typing exclamation mark raffle in the chat, but sub first to get two chances to win and support your favorite streamer with your suggestions at the end of the show to see who we raid this evening. That is thanks to our sponsor, CoolStuffing.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every single day. So our first pick for this week, again... We're a little lo-fi, don't have graphics for two people, so it's just us. But our first pick of this week is Dominaria Week 1, the official week. The actual paper release comes out tomorrow. We've been able to play this digitally. We've been able to play it in pre-releases. If you guys were able to go to your local stores and or maybe buy set booster boxes, for example, if you wanted to crack some packs. Um, but for me, I generally experience magic in a very digital MTG arena feature, you know, focused way these days. And so I've been drafting, drafting, drafting. And I think the set is dope. I'm not sure if I want to call it best ever, yada yada, but I think it's still very, very good right now. I drafted until I ran out of gold and gems and had a great time, but I didn't figure out the format quick enough to go infinite. Uh, so I have to rebuild up my bankroll to uh, to give it another shot. You know, I when I play when I play those drafts, like sort of the expensive drafts when it first comes out, my hope. It's just four wins. Just just let me yeah. pay 100 gems. If I paid 100 gems for a draft, I'm cool with that. Just get me to four wins. And so, man, you owe three, and there ain't no dagger that digs in quite as hard as that one. Oof. Yeah. Even a 1-3 only gives you 100 gems, and it's like, I don't, why would just, I'd rather not have anything. Yeah, like, you're just hurting me. Why am I even here? But, yeah, I, it was, it's been tough because, you know, the lure and attraction of domain every single draft mm -hmm. is so strong for me. And sometimes it's just not there. Sometimes you do not get the payoffs. Sometimes it's not, it's just not the right deck to pick, um, you know, and, and you end up in pack three and you're like, wow, they're still passing all these red, black sacrifice cards and I can't get a dual land to save my life. But, uh, you know, sometimes you get paid off and rewarded and sometimes you don't. That's my problem. Yeah, it, it uh, you know, I would like to say that you know, I've learned a, a, a ton about sending signals. I really haven't. A ton about knowing when the deck's going to be amazing and when it's not. Sometimes I've gotten, you know, you've drafted the, oh my God, bomber or so-and-so, and you just, you know, one, three, or maybe two, three, or something, and you just feel bad about it. Um, but again, I feel like this format is very complicated in a good way. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Um, I love I love Kicker. I love the off-color Kicker stuff. I think is great. Um, I think the Legends, again, they're able to push the power level of those individual cards so much to make them really interesting and exciting. Um, and as I was talking about in the pre-show for me, the black-white decks have just been really performing well for me. Um, if you're a part of our Patreon, you can check out our Discord and the deck building channel where I have some of my successful drafts that I've done there. A lot are very unsuccessful. Like, I, you know, I think I've found at this point, I just should never, ever draft the blue-red spells deck. I don't care what yeah. format it is. I don't care what set it is. I can't make it work. I, from Ikoria to here to, to back in Ravnica to anywhere, literally anywhere that has a blue-red yeah. spells deck in it, I cannot make it work. That's just a thing I can't do. I understand why they had to put blue red spells in this set because we're going to get blue red artifacts as a strategy in the next set. Mm -hmm. However, it makes me sad when you have a card like Joyra that depends on artifacts and you've got, you know, and it's undraftable basically. And it's basically, yeah, it's not the blue red spells deck is not good. Um, 
but it, yeah, that that's that's unfortunate, and I don't I don't ever like drafting that deck. However, blue white flyers always playable, even when it's not the archetype of blue white. I mean, you got that that Lord guy that makes soldiers whenever you play spells. That blue white guy, that guy's cool. That, that's a super yeah. cool guy. I like that. that fine. Blue-white. That's a blue white spells card. It's true. Less than a blue white flyers card. Yeah, I see that in like the the Jeskai versions of the spells deck, you know, a lot of the yeah. times. Um, but you know, again, overall, I I'm still digging it. I think it's great. I felt like at even at this point in Streets of New Capenna's sort of lifespan, it felt like, hey, this three color set is not for three color decks. Like, it really started week one. It was just like, you know, if you just play two colors, you might be better off. And then that just kind of percolated and went on for the rest of the format. Whereas Dominaria, I feel like you need to build a real deck like you need it needs to come together but you really have to build a you know a deck that has moving parts that work together in some form or fashion around a theme and if it doesn't work you might as well just do another draft like right i've had blue green piles of some creatures and some card draw and it's just like no <laughs> i mean <laughs> just... my blue green piles of some creatures and some card draw have been fine well, that's good. it's just that most of my blue green like domain piles have also had black for removal um which i guess is mandatory in this set there isn't really unless you get a bunch of bite downs right you need a bunch your... of fight cards for green and yeah blue if you, don't... you need you need the bite downs with the death touchers if you're mm-hmm. going to stick to straight blue green otherwise tribute to urborg is kind of a necessary evil um but for the most part i've not found the uh the card flow blue green archetype to be suffering from a lack of removal and, and like tail swipe as the uncommon is a sick one uh yep. that card the cards are an instant for god's sake that's a one mana like fight card okay that's that's and then if you main phase it it kills everything yeah just kills actual everything everything's a two two or a two three in this set so yeah so that's huge um but the uh the standard format the constructed formats are sweet i've definitely felt the upgrade to elves in historic with the new elf lord that card is really really good um and in standard mono black baby said the first time since what desecration demon standard yeah Thought sees pack rat. It's been a minute since Gary took over. Um, yeah, and this is the first mono black without a thought sees. Um, it remains to be seen if this mono black version will be as dominant as any of those. Because mm-hmm. um, if you recall, the mono black devotion deck took a while to catch on. The mono black, like, other, like the other mono black desecration demon thought sees kind of deck. Mm-hmm. took a little bit before like pack rat was not an automatic hit right they took it took so, like a pro tour right for those things yeah. to really show up and be like wait so, a minute. so you know and, and a lot of things are dominant when they come out and then it takes a little while and usually what happens is the pros are like no 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 we've got this we can mitigate the problems mm-hmm. we don't have as many or any pros anymore and so it remains to be seen exactly uh how the metagames will shift if pr- presumably just slower um rather than you know the pro tour comes around and everything gets turned on its head but it's easy to see why mono black is so popular you've got the glue that holds everything together with this invoke despair card Mm -hmm. um that that sort of fills up a bunch of the gaps that you have in mono black and then just a bunch of really solid good role players no one is the star of the show in mono black you've got shale dread I mean, liliana, liliana right? solid removal i would argue that liliana is like not even in the god draw for that deck yeah, like you want to go probably is <laughs> yeah you want to go like tenacious underdog graveyard trespasser shale dread and like that's the god draw it's a lot more like an old jund deck yeah. than it is a mono black control deck this is a mid-range pressure you kind of archetype um, and it's fun. It's interesting. There are decision trees to make. It's not oppressive, right. uh, whether you're playing with it or against it. You know what you're getting with Mono Black. And so if you have a deck like that as the best deck in the format that says, come at me, bro, you know what you need to do in order to beat it. I like that as a standard format. You know, it's funny. While these days, and we were talking about a little bit in the pre-show where 
there's not a lot of pro articles. You know, there's not Jerry Thompson on Monday or whatever, or Patrick Chapin on Monday. You know, there's Flores is still around, which is great. Um, but there's a ton of pros who are no longer writing and talking about Magic every single week, week in, week out, who are trying to analyze these cards, analyze these decks, break the format, make something new and different, yada, yada. And I'll be honest, what it looks like is we've sw- we've swapped over to solving, instead of solving constructed formats, we're solving the limited formats like that. All of the trackers that we have these days, it does look like... limited. Yeah, and all the, you know, it felt like Wizards was so afraid of the constructed side of things being broken and solved and blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's the problem. I think limited being solved, that's the problem. Like... Yeah, I would argue that limited is not solved. I mean... But I know that, I know that this Wingspan card... Uh, the Defender's deck is very good. I would not argue that it is solved. Um, there are way. I think that the the formats are going to be able to easily evolve to be able to handle that card. There is a red card in this set that that says choose one and has three modes. One of the mode is kill everything that has one toughness, and the another mode is destroy target defender. Um, I forget what that card's called, but it's a common in red. It's like rest uh, of pieces or something, or ripping yeah. something. Yeah, and know. and so there are ways for the format to evolve and change, and I think that as these formats oftentimes do, Dominaria did. Dominaria began with, if you recall, everyone was like, the kicker deck can't be beat. Like the kicker deck is the best thing can, that that any that has happened since sliced bread, and that's kind of where my you know my domain dreams began with old Dominaria, yeah. uh, and then you know people found that no, it's not the only thing that can win. Every archetype actually has answers. You just need to be prepared to uh, to handle uh, certain things. So, right. but I think that there's if you build your decks planning to play against late game domain and build your decks planning to play against an O3 wing mantle chaplain, uh, you're going to have a good shot. And I, and I certainly understand the idea that the defender deck doesn't work when a bunch of people are trying to draft it. That's cool. Uh, and another way to think of it, I think is to look at the, uh, Baldur's gate alchemy Baldur's gate thing, which was solved in that you should not be playing blue. Like it was sure. clear. It was mathematically proven beyond all shadows of doubt. It's not like blue is completely like you cannot win because the creatures don't deal damage or something like blue still did things. It just was the worst at doing the things. And so to mathematically have that be proven and shown, will affect an entire format, good, bad, or ugly. Sure, I agree with that. But we're getting to a wider issue here, which is availability of information, which, boy, we've talked about, Evan and I, in the past, on this show and before, Mm -hmm. um, is, is readily available information hurting magic in some way? Is the fact that we have all of these statistics and draft sim and 17 lands, uh, is that... Uh, a negative or is the fact that that people laymen such as myself who can't do the math who can't put 60 hours in who can't necessarily dedicate their life and and uh waking hours to figuring out what the best thing is is that hurting magic i don't know i mean you know, and at its very very core magic is a game of math and if you crunch enough numbers long enough and you work on the percentages long enough, um, you know, is are you able to mathematically get a so-and-so? I don't know. And we, we've had these debates for many, many years. This goes back for 10, 15 years on Star City Games where there was an article about what if there were no restrictions in Vintage and you could play four Black Lotuses and you could play four of X and Y and whatever. Um, and at the time, I recall, it ended up being a combo. There was a Goblin Aggro, there was a combo deck, and there was like a control deck that just kind of countered everything you were trying to do. And it kind of made its own little weird metagame. So... You know, ultimately, it's probably going to flatten out, but I do also recognize that Wizards has said, you know, they're aware of how quickly a limited format can be displayed. You know what I'm saying? Like, sort of laid out mathematically. And I think they, they the last thing they want is that to be clear, you know what I mean? That to be solved in that way. Um, sure. But that's interesting. And e- either way, I, I'm still enjoying the draft format. I'm not, like, completely over it like I was, like, one week, maybe two weeks into... 
uh, uh, Crimson Vow. That was the sure. blood, the blood token yeah, one. I was I mean, over it. I get that there, there has something has to be the best. Right. And if the defenders deck that depends on four mana defenders searching up more four mana defenders is somehow the best, fine. So be it. <laughs> You have a really interesting format if that is your best deck. Yeah. Uh, cool, cool, cool. So, again, Dominaria, I think, is sweet. We're still finding out cool constructed decks. I don't think Mono Black is the end of this, you know, finding yeah. out of cool cards. There's still In great standard cards In right now, you do need to have a plan for Shale Dread. Yeah, and um, Liliana. I, I don't think you need to have a plan for Liliana. Well, you, you keep to, saying this. Well, you I don't know think Liliana to, is good well, she's, as, as Shaeldred. Well, she's going to be played. Slash, she's you're going to be played. So, she, you know, you're going to have the discard stuff. Are you okay with that? Do you care? Right. You know, or can you take advantage of that? Or can you deal the damage after she makes you sack your creature to kill her off so that she doesn't become a problem the whole game? That's yeah. the thing. Shoulder is just like run creature removal. Like, okay. You know, but, but Leon, Liliana, right. I think you have be to be able to deal with the, the five modes. toughness, four mana creature. Yeah, is is what that is. So you know, faithful absence, infernal grasp, mm -hmm. uh, burn down the house if you really want to have like a late game wrath kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All of these are viable. Yeah, depopulate sees so, play. Depopulate does see play, which is nice, but also doesn't get rid of Liliana. So like, you know, sure. to me, Liliana becomes an issue. No, it's not a problem if you can get rid of her immediately and know what you're doing there. But yeah, beyond that, again, that's that's week one. Again, I'm hearing about Sulkinars coming up with some different decks. I'm excited to try those out. I was talking about I was played against Shanna. Um, the the Bant, you know, green, white, blue girl who pay life and pay X to draw cards, which was really impressive, and I'd never played against her before. Um, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. That said, we're going to move out of our first pick to gather the townsfolk. Thanks to our sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. And, again, my apologies for no graphics this week, but uh, we move on here to talk a little bit about the Painlands. There was a thread that was done by Mr. Ethan Fleischer, who is a wonderful designer at Wizards of the Coast, and he talks about the Painland thread, the fact that they reprinted six of the Ice Age slash Apocalypse Painlands in uh, Dominari United. Why these six and not the other four? For example, right. those other four didn't exist as places <laughs> during yeah. Dominar United slash the Brothers War. So that's the thing. I found that super fascinating because I was like, why did they do it this way? Why are they why didn't they just do the allied pain lands and the enemy pain lands like they did in Apocalypse? Like why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? And it makes sense. Now that it's been explained to me, there was no place such as a dark R for there to be a dark R waste. There was no Carplusin forests. There was no Yavi Maya for there to be a coast of yet. Um, so all of this was very shocking to me. Now, they did move in uh, Shiv and Reef into DMU just to help standard work better. Um, so they removed that from Brothers War into DMU, uh, which is sweet. But ultimately, it's I, I love this type of stuff, how the sausage is made. When Wizards is able to pull back the curtain, it's silly. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean a lot. But for those who are, you know, we're knee deep in everything magic, like, just tell me how the Painlands got there. Why? Yeah. Why those Painlands? I personally am super sad that I don't have access to a Battlefield Forge right now based on my, my standard deck of choice. Um, I'm, I'm playing like a Wind Scarred Crag in my red-white deck, which is yeah, pretty bad. But um, I, And the other one that was interesting was Cave of Koilos, which mm. of the Pain Lands, you know, they've all got kind of generic names. They've all got, you know, not super specific things happening. Cave of Koilos is a very specific location mm -hmm. that is very central to the plot of the Brothers' War. This is where the incursion took place. This is the cave where the dragon uh, Koilos was, if I mm -hmm. recall correctly. This is where the Phyrexians breached. So to have it here is super fascinating. Yeah, I mean, they noticed that it's still present in Dominaria today, right? Caves Coilos could be in the Brothers War set. Um, so it certainly plays a much larger role in that story, but it's nice to have it, I think, early. Well, yeah. early. This is back when we had the Pathways, right? The Pathways took a couple sets to get here. Once they got here, they didn't, you know, there wasn't any big deal about it. It was like, oh, we finally have the rest of the Pathways, and then we just used our right. cool mana bases until they went away. Um, but yeah, I, I love the fact that, man, that painlands are back and are in you know pioneer and they're in explorer and stuff like that now um mm -hmm. and that's fantastic i love it 
Yeah. The other one that's interesting to me is that they this is uh, it will surprise or at least educate new people that Yavi Maya is younger than Lanawar. I think I think that that is something that is maybe not a piece of lore that everybody knows. Um, that the land war forest is so old. I mean, if you think about it, I guess land war elves have been always been around and right. not Yavi Maya elves. Um, but I think that that's interesting. So when land war wastes comes in the brothers war, uh, we get a little bit more lore. Nice. There you go. Uh, so that is awesome and sweet. Uh, this week, I'm going to bring up here two seconds. Um, there is the Astrology Lands Virgo were announced as part of the Secret Layers. Let's see if we can get this out of here. Um, but, you know, this is one of the coolest looking ones so far. Is it? I mean, I don't understand what's happening. In... I mean, eh. <laughs> what is the symbol for Virgo? What are we doing here? I don't, I don't exactly like. This looks like spiders, Spider Man. Yeah, it's an Earth sign, and it's an island. I don't necessarily understand it. As as this entire thing has gone on, I have continuously went like, "What is happening?" <laughs> I don't understand what the Virgo sign is. If there's any Virgos in chat, tell me. Let us know what is happening. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is like I'm looking forward to Libra. That's my sign. So, it's my sign too. So let's we'll go. We'll get the scales. Yeah, we'll get what the scales. What kind of basic do you think we get as Libras? Blue? We get I, an island? I think we might get planes. Planes um, is good. I'll I could planes. also see a forest in that, you know, you want nature and acreage to be equal and the equilibrium of nature and stuff like that, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely don't see a swamp. I don't see a mountain. But I could see, you know, I could see island, planes, or forest for a Libra. Yeah, I mean, it was wild to me that, like, Cancer didn't get an island when they're a crab. <laughs> Virgo was an right? island and Cancer's plane. It was, it, that was a little strange. Um, That's so silly. What was the, there was another one that was weird. Oh, they're a lot weird, buddy. I mean, at least Leo I got planes. Leo got planes, which was a good one. Which was good, yeah. Um, but yeah, the Cancer planes was an odd choice. Yeah, again, this whole thing, the astrology lands available all year. I don't know what, whose idea that was, and Lord knows I like an experiment, but wow, this was such a weird one. Uh, either way, that is a new secret layer set of lands that you can go purchase if you would like to. Uh, that said, we're moving here to Desperate Ravens and specifically into Splash Damage. Check out our altar sleeves. Support the use support the show by using the code Magic Mike's at checkout for five percent off anything in the store, including a set of exclusive sleeves featuring the Magic Mike's crew at altersleeves.com slash magic mics. The URL is on the screen right now to check that stuff out. Tell them we sent you and whatnot. And for this week's magical splash damage, which I also don't have the correct slide for, but whatever. We'll take a look at Disney Lorcana. That's right. A different game, because that's where we're at. Um, but this should be a really sweet one, though. Uh, the first cards for Lorcana, Disney's answer to Magic the Gathering, are spectacular, says the Polygon article. Uh, these are the arriving today at the D23 convention in Anaheim, California, and they look freaking sweet. Um, these cards are laid out, I think, very nicely. They clearly have a Magic R&D influence of some nature. Um, there is one mana cost to rule them all. There is a clear power and toughness there in the middle. Each version, each character has a version of itself. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly going to be more than one Robin Hood. The uh, flavor text or the sort of the flavor next to the abilities that they have, I think, is terrific. Um, and you know, the idea that these are going to be promos you can buy right now at the D23 uh, convention. If you're able to, for the love of God, get a set. Uh, just stick it in your closet and thank me next year. Uh, mm -hmm. because these are going to be worth a ton of money one day, maybe sooner than later. Uh, but I also know that Wizards, or Wizards, uh, Ravensburger uh, and Disney are dedicating multiple years of development to this game, and that could yeah. be huge. So there's a number of things happening on these cards. I think that Magic players will pretty easily be able to grok what's going on. Like, if we look at Elsa, there's two power, there's three toughness, it costs three, and it has the ability of freeze, and then a little symbol that definitely looks like a tap symbol, mm -hmm. and then it says exert chosen opposing character. That certainly sounds like it's tapping something down. 
Yep. Uh, like that, that Grox, right? We yeah. just get what that is. Um, the only mysterious thing to me in any of these is this weird symbol or symbols in the lower right hand side, these little diamonds. Yeah. Which you had an interesting theory about um, that I would love for you to tell the audience because I think it's the most likely scenario I've heard of. Sure. Um, well, I, I used to play a game called the G.I. Joe TCG, which was a wonderful game, by the way, and also designed by uh, Aaron Forsyth. And so kudos to him for making a great game. But unfortunately, it was discontinued uh, early in its life. But one of the things it had that was really, really cool and interesting was there were a certain number of like bullets, like bullet pips or whatever, on the right side of the card. And there were certain things in the game that would have you reveal cards off the top of your library, and you would count those pips. And the number of pips that were revealed and or counted mattered in a variety of ways. Um, and so if you're able to flip up Elsa and you get the one pip, or you're able to flip up Maleficent and get two pips, and down here there is a promo card for Mickey Mouse that apparently you only get by those D23 people who attend the convention. Mother of God put this thing in a sleeve. Uh, this yeah. thing has four of those pips, so that should be really interesting. Yeah. And so if you're planning on going to the D23 Expo, uh, this Mickey Mouse Brave Little Taylor card is only available there, so this will certainly be a collector's item for sure. For sure. And again, this is one of those that even if the game were to fail, um, you know, over time or whatever, uh, you know, it's going to be big at the very least at the beginning of it. Like we've I've seen a lot of these games come and go. This is some of the largest IP that's ever come into the space. This is one of the biggest producers of games. You know, for example, they can keep up with the print runs necessary. Uh, they're hiring, you know, previous Wizards folks to come on board. The cards that we see right now all make sense and they look good and they seem sweet. The game clearly looks like it's sort of a Hearthstone-y type thing. We're able to challenge certain characters against one another, yeah. which makes sense. Um, and there's only one mana cost, so there's no weird, like, trying to explain a white mana or a blue mana or whatever. Um, but the cards have sort of colors on them with the color bands of the, the names of the characters, which might matter or have something to do with, with something or else. Um, don't know yet. But I do know that this is really cool and spells, I don't know, more competition in the market. And that's yep. I'd love to see that. And, you know, this is one of the things that we talked about last week in that, you know, I was like, you know, organized play and they're like, rrr, rrr, tournaments. And I'm like, no, I'm talking about f &M. You know, getting people just to sit down and play this, getting butts in seats, getting the, getting the parents and the kids who are already going to these game stores for Pokemon and say, hey, there's this cool new game. You know, you yeah. check out this discounted starter deck or whatever, or there's this, you know, there's new thing. We get some promos this weekend. And before you know it, you throw enough, you know, commercials on Disney Channel you yeah. could have a serious contender here. I'm I'm happy. I'm excited for this. I think that this is a an earnest opportunity for there to be another trading card game that will probably just bolster how many people play Magic, right? Like I don't look at Lorcana as a threat to Magic. Not um, in the same way that I look at like Hearthstone as a threat to Magic or I looked at um, uh, flesh and blood as a threat to magic, right? Yeah. I feel like the audience for Lorcana is not the same as the audience for Magic the Gathering, like whole cloth. I feel like this is another situation similar to how I felt about Pokemon before Pokemon kind of took over, mm -hmm. where uh, players who play Lorcana will later find magic, right? Right? Yeah, I feel is... like that's the that's the pipeline, right? This is a gateway game. I can definitely see. And, and and for example, you know, Pokemon is, is also a gateway game in that things are sort of very simple, like the cards do sort of what they say, and you can only play one card for free. Yu-Gi-Oh! is also very similar in that there's no mana cost for stuff. You just play stuff, and it lets you play stuff, and you read the card, and nowadays those cards have like 130 words on them, but whatever. Um, this to me is nice, easy, clear, functional. Again, you know, I'm hoping to hear more about, uh, you know, organized play stuff, and I'm hoping to hear more about digital stuff, which I think another would be another huge realm that they can uh, enter and be a part of um, but yeah I don't think Wizards is like quaking in their boots but I also think Wizards is not just going to put a blind eye you know towards what they're doing um, I don't see Magic Junior anytime soon you know what I mean sure. I think they kind of tried that with Portal back in the day and it kind of came off weird and awkward um, you know how do we how do we dumb down and of course everyone loves things that are dumbed down so yeah yeah that's not going to work um, but this is sweet and I could definitely see parents getting excited about the ability to hey my kid wants to go to the card shop with me 
and it's not just Pokemon or the kids don't like Pokemon, but they like a Disney movie. You know, for example, yeah. you know, little girls, it's difficult to get them into any sort of competitive space um, with a card game. And so that would help out a lot as well. Um, very so uh, the last thing that we I did not see in our uh, in our doc is that we now have a list of where to find Warhammer 40K commander deck previews. We do. Um, the commander the uh, the commander deck for Warhammer, the collector decks are freaking rare. Y'all, listen, CSI, we had to pull all of our ones available down because allocations are getting tougher. They are rare. They are, they, I've already told you they're rare. They are rarer than I was explaining weeks and months ago. They're even more rare than that. At this point, if you can literally find them at all for probably less than, like we're talking about a set of four, for less than 550 bucks, it, it's right. probably a deal and a half at this point because the thing's going to be worth a million dollars and that's awesome. The regular deck's going to be worth you know, plenty, I'm sure, but they're also going to be available everywhere. They're not going to be just sold out immediately. So I don't know exactly why you would have a collector deck and not make it a little bit more available, but I also see how you can make a collector deck and make it super hard to find because you want it to be very rare and expensive and so right. It's for collectors and Warhammer folks are going to come out of the woodwork to pick them up anyway. Hopefully they can find them. Um, it Hopefully. seems like the previews uh, the people who know Warhammer mm -hmm. and know Warhammer content are happy with where the previews have gone. So kudos. Good job. Did they re did their research? Yeah, like Pleasant Kenobi is huge into Warhammer and he loves Warhammer stuff. And he's getting like one of the whole the entire decks that he's able to spoil, which is great. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, good for him. And that's awesome. Um, you know, it's it's great when Wizards is able to pair those things together. Give Jim Davis the Goblin preview. You know what I mean? Like back in the day, Aaron Campbell should have gotten the Dredge preview, but sure. didn't. But, you know, but we can fix yeah. those things. Apparently Cameron from Loading Ready Run, I'm being told in the chat, is a big uh, um, Warhammer person. And so nice. uh, I, I would like nothing more than to listen to Cameron explain anything, much less something that he's passionate about. Yeah, he's super good at that stuff. Um, that said, that is the end of our show this week. Again, we... Uh, didn't have a ton to talk about, but we certainly appreciate you guys hanging out. We're going to turn the corner here to the finisher. Now, quote, we appreciate the trust MPG has placed in Flex to design and manufacture its premium state-of-the-art hair dryer, unquote, says David Moses, the president of Lifestyle Solutions on their impending partnership with MPG Co., a beauty brand from Japan, and not a popular trading card game, but I did, uh, but I definitely did a double take reading that headline. So tell me, what's the next beauty partnership for Magic, Ruben? Well, you already have shiny sleeves and fancy play mats, so why not get the cuticles to match? Introducing DCI claws. Put one of each color in the wheel on your hands the next time you call for a judge. <laughs> I'll, I'll play Nerd Girl this, this week. Sure. You, you already make up reasons why you lose, so why not make up your makeup too? Introducing Paint Lands. Finally, the perfect mascara to make your opponents blush. Okay. Okay. Look. Passion. Excitement. Intrigue. Presenting the new scent from Magic Deodorant. Use it at your next convention, please. Dear God. Please. Deodorant. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That ends the live episode of Magic Mike's. Thanks for joining us here to discuss all things magic. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. And we're going to move on here to our final, final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsors, CardHoarder.com, and Alter Sleeves, my co-hosts, MTG Nerd Girl and Ruben Bresser, even though she couldn't make it this week. You guys for watching and listening. Hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mikes. Please follow, like, tweet, favor, share, subscribe to everything social. Tells people we exist. Catch us online on our Discord, on our Discord rather, Twitch.tv at Magic Mikes, on Twitter at Magic Mikes Cast, our Magic Mikes subreddit, and like the Magic Mikes page on Facebook. Or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mikes. Good night, everybody.